the Bible, there are several different accounts of how creation happened. As the writers in different times and ages and places were trying to grapple with how do we understand who God is, who we are, and how we got here. We often are familiar with the ones in Genesis 1 and 2, but there's one in Psalm 104 that is particularly uh, beautiful and poignant, and it begins this way. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their water. I once heard Bill Brown describe this text as if the wrapping God's self with light is like the putting on of a prayer shawl in the Jewish tradition. And the stretching out of the heavens like a tent is the creation of a tabernacle. And so here we see the psalmist imagining this planet as a sacred place, a place of prayer, a place of worship. And indeed, it, it makes all of us, I think, when we get a moment to really take in the beauty around us. And just this morning, I was looking up at the beautiful redwood trees in my yard. There's a sense of awe, a sense of lifted into something above our dreariness that we often experience in our life. And so this last soul circle is on earth care. This is always a difficult topic these days. It shouldn't be. Uh, our environment and our climate and our planet need our attention and need us to shift our practices. And yet this topic has been so politicized in the last 40 years that it's hard to have a conversation with it about it without um, a little bit of shame, a little bit of suspicion, a little bit of wondering where someone is coming from. And that's never a good place to start a conversation. The thing that I find that has been most helpful for me in recent years is to read some really good fiction about this topic. And two books stand out by the same author. The first one is won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. It's called The Overstory by Richard Powers, and I highly recommend it to you. It's a beautiful book. The second one uh, is more recent, came out this year. It's called Bewilderment by Richard Powers. And it tells the story of a young boy named Robin who has lost his mother. His mother's died a few years before. Robin is on the autism spectrum, and so he's um, got some different ways of intelligence and putting the world together. And Robin inherited from his mother and his father, who's an astrobiologist, a love of the natural world and a love of all beings and all of creation. And he's angry. He's angry at the ways that people are not... Um, sensing the urgency that our planet needs um, for us to address the crises that are continuing to come to us. And yet Robin then becomes um, able to engage in a study uh, to help him develop empathy. And they use uh, the emotions that have been tracked by his mother a few years before to to help him experience the emotions of his mother. So he goes into a room and he's all wired up. And in this experience, this neurological experience, he's able to begin to experience the emotions of his mother. And Richard Powers calls this, um, in a later interview, an empathy machine. And he begins to have empathy and be able to feel what his mother was feeling. And in that, he begins to change. He begins to feel connection with everyone and everything. He notices the feelings of others and no longer gets triggered when kids bully him. He begins to see where the birds are making their nests in the trees and he begins to pay attention to the trees themselves. He begins to live as I think we all want to live in this deep harmony with all created beings. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story to remind us that, that what we all might consider normal intelligences are not always the ones we need to lead us forward. We actually need folks who are thinking differently about this world and this planet, but also the power of empathy, the power of connection, and that really our hope moving forward is a sense of kinship, of connection 
with each other. Recently, a study um, done by Yale said that the overwhelming majority of Americans think that we are in a climate crisis, but an overwhelming majority of Americans do not talk about it with their friends. So we all, across political parties, across, you know, across geographies, we all know that the climate is in trouble, or at least a lot of us do. We all understand that scientists and, and climate scientists are saying we need to do something, and we're all worried about it, and yet we don't talk to each other about it. Maybe because we're afraid that someone's going to disagree with us. Maybe because it just seems like kind of a bummer of a topic to bring up. Um, I, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons. But I do want to say that um, I think that we want to be a place at Valley Presbyterian and in your soul circle to today where we learn to talk about it a little bit. And so there's a first a few things that I want to just offer. First of all, I think we need to allow ourselves to be a little saddened by it, to grieve what has been lost. I, I'm sad every year that this beautiful Western United States that I grew up in is under a cloud of smoke, something that didn't happen when I was a child growing up here. And, and so I, I and all of us need to allow ourselves some space to grieve. Um, the damage that has been done, some of it irreversible, some of it potentially reversible. Secondly, I think we need to be in community around this topic. We need to tell our stories and we need to be in conversation. We need to make space for authentic and real conversations. We need to um, not have um, you know, environmental Olympics with each other where one person is more enlightened than the other or one person's practices are better than the other. We need to be in community around this topic in a way that's not about guilt or what we should be doing, but really is about a space of us in conversation and allowing transformation to happen. But that's not going to happen either with a lot of guilt or with no talking at all. So we need to find a different way to be together around this. And the third is, of course, practices. Yes, yes, please recycle. Yes, consider how to, to, to wean yourself off of fossil fuels wherever possible. Yes, consider advocacy and, and whatever that looks like for you. Yes, those are all important practices that we all should be considering. And yet also, we want to consider practices of joy practices of beauty, practices of simplicity and nourishment. And as we, as we begin to, to lean into those, those aff affirmative practices, we then, I think, can begin to experience what the psalmist experienced when he imagined this planet as a place of prayer. We can begin to know what it's like for Robin to experience empathy and a kinship with every living thing. We begin to live in this world in a different way. And so let's find a way forward in our conversations tonight, just taking one tiny step and imagining a different world. Mm -hmm.